Please take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Today we're going to look at verses 14 through 20 as we continue our study of the fascinating visions of the future that Yeshua gave to the Apostle John. And we're studying Revelation for one reason, because it's the only book in the Bible that promises blessings to those who read and hear its words and obey them. And in chapter 4, verse 1, Yeshua says that he will show John things which must be hereafter, referring to future events that will come to pass someday. We study these events in order to know what's going to happen and to reaffirm our faith if and when we see them come to pass during our lifetime. We don't know when these things we, will happen, but we can be sure that they will literally take place. Now, in recent weeks, we've been studying the coming final world political and religious empire before Yeshua's return. That includes a beast who is more commonly known as the Antichrist, and a second beast who is also called the false prophet. Three weeks ago, we studied the mark of the beast. Two weeks ago, we took another look at the 144,000 who were discussed in chapters 7 and 14. And if you missed any of my teachings on those topics, or if you want to see them again, they are on my YouTube channel. I won't take the time to review everything we have learned in these recent lessons, but for the benefit of our newcomers and anyone who missed those lessons, I do want to remind us of a few important principles that we need to remember as we go through the remaining chapters of Revelation. First, it's important to realize that the beast that rises up from the sea in chapter 13 verse 1 represents both a global government and religious system and the beast himself, the person in charge of it, the Antichrist. We see in the last eight verses of Revelation 13 that a second beast, the false prophet, leads the world to worship the first beast, the Antichrist. Remember that they're two different people. Revelation 19 verse 20 makes that clear. Now I think that the Antichrist may be a politician, possibly a former military leader, who will be smooth and charismatic at first, but eventually will be seen as a brutal dictator while the false prophet will be a religious leader along the lines of a pope or a Jewish high priest or an Islamic caliph or imam. And I believe this false prophet will achieve what may seem impossible to us today by somehow persuading the leaders of Islam, rabbinic Judaism, Christianity, and all the other religions of the world to collaborate and work together to set aside their differences and figure out a way to bring all of the world's religions together into one new worldwide religion that worships the Antichrist as either as God or as the long-awaited Savior Messiah that each religion anticipates. And the false prophet will be the head of this new false one-world global religion doing miracles and leading the whole world to worship the Antichrist and to make an image of him. Three weeks ago we went through a detailed analysis of verses 16 through 18 of chapter 3 in the Mark of the Beast. If you want to dig into that subject and if you missed that lesson I encourage you to watch my YouTube video called The False Prophet and the Mark of the Beast. A very important key in understanding Revelation is to realize that the events discussed in these pages are not described in a single chronological order. I believe that chapters 1 through 11 are pretty much in chronological order, beginning in the first century and ending with the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of His Messiah with an occasional break in the main storyline where we have a parenthetical passage when John discusses something else and then comes back to resume the main storyline. 
And then in chapters 12 through 22, he repeats the same story that's told in the first 11 chapters with additional information. The sequence of the future events in both sections of Revelation matches up well with Yeshua's words in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. We have the Great Tribulation, which is a time of persecution, and then the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened, and then the 144,000, and then the rapture and the first resurrection of the dead. Now last week, we studied the three angelic proclamations in verses 6 through 13 of chapter 14. We saw in verse 6 that the first angel has the everlasting gospel to preach to those who are still on the earth at that time. This angel is encouraging the believers in the great tribulation, giving them comfort and courage and reminding everyone of God's coming judgment. This angel is also giving the wicked one last opportunity to repent and to fear God and give glory to him. We saw in verse 8 that a second angel speaks of the great city of Babylon falling because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now in scripture, Babylon represents the ancient Babylonian Empire and the city in that empire that was one of the largest cities in the ancient world. And in the, in the end times, Babylon is associated with the religious and political system and government of the beast, the Antichrist. Now ancient Babylon was corrupt and it lured other nations into immorality. And in some form, one way or another, Babylon will arise again, leading the nations of the world into spiritual fornication, into the worship of other gods. And it will be destroyed again when, when it receives God's wrath, which the Bible sometimes describes as a cup or as wine. Now, many have thought have thought through the centuries that end times Babylon is Rome and the Vatican. Newer interpretations have shifted to include the ideas that it is America and especially New York City or Mecca in Saudi Arabia and maybe that it is simply ancient Babylon rebuilt. We will get into that more in future chapters, but here in chapter 14, Babylon's coming downfall is being announced. We saw the mark of the beast discussed again in verses 9 through 11. And all I want to say about it today is do not receive it or you will be lost forever. And this is irrevocable. Once you take it, your fate of everlasting punishment is sealed forever. If you missed that lesson, again, if, and if you want to learn more about that, watch that video, The False Prophet and the Mark of the Beast. And then to finish up with our recap in verse 12 of chapter 14, we see the Bible's definition for saints. Folks who grew up in a church like the Catholic Church that identifies certain people, nuns and priests and popes as saints because of their unusual uh, strong faith and things that they have done for the church through the years gives the impression that only those people can be identified as saints. But that's not what the Bible says. According to the Bible, all genuine believers are saints. And they are defined for us here in Revelation 14 verse 12. It says the saints are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. It takes both. In verses 6 through 13 of chapter 14, the believers who remain alive on the earth at this point are being told, and I paraphrase here, whatever you do, don't take the mark of the beast like those whose destiny is everlasting torment in the lake of fire and brimstone. Remain faithful and obedient. Endure till the end. 
And if we should die for our faith while we're waiting for Messiah to come back, we should rejoice, for we are blessed. We will rest from our labors, and we will be rewarded for our good works done on the earth. So now let's go on and finish chapter 14, beginning today in verse 14. The Bible says, or John says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time is come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, while you're thinking about these verses, keep that page in your Bible bookmarked and turn to Acts chapter 1. And as you're turning there, ask yourself, who is this sitting on a white cloud? Remember that just as Yeshua was received up into the clouds when he ascended to heaven, the Bible says he will also appear in the clouds when he returns. We see this detail stated in Acts chapter 1 at his ascension into heaven. Beginning in verse 9, the Bible says, And when he, Yeshua, had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Yeshua, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Yeshua is going to come back the same way he went up in the clouds. He will come first to gather his people from all over the world. All true, faithful, obedient, genuine believers, whether they're Jewish, Israelite, or former Gentiles who have been grafted in, to the Israel of God and adopted into his family. You know, that's what the church is. The church is not a separate Gentile, non-Jewish entity. When we come to faith in the Jewish Messiah and repent of our sin, which is disobeying God's commandments, the Bible says we are adopted into God's family of people that is called Israel. And I'm not talking about the nation in the Mideast today as much as I am a spiritual entity of the true, genuine people of God. We're grafted in. Christians don't replace Israel. They become part of it. The Israel of God is what Paul calls it in Galatians 6, 16. Now, some people have trouble with the idea of Yeshua responding to an angel who in verse 15 comes out of the heavenly temple telling him to do something. They think, well that must not be him. But someone who is described as sitting on a white cloud like the Son of Man and wearing a golden crown can only be Yeshua. Angels are never described in the Bible as wearing crowns or even being promised any crowns, especially a gold one. Now remember that in the Gospels, Yeshua's apostles asked him to tell them the sign of his coming. And in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, his answer includes these words. He said, but of that day and that hour knows no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Yeshua was saying, hey guys, I don't even know exactly when it's going to be at this time. When he was on the earth, living as a man, speaking these words, he did not know the day or the hour of his future return. Now, we may think that he knows now as he is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, but the, actually the Bible doesn't say that. Amen. Only the Father knows. 
And maybe the father will communicate to the son when the time finally arrives by sending an angel, which is a messenger. That's the meaning of the word for angel. Sending a messenger to tell him that it's time. This angel isn't telling Yeshua what to do as much as he is telling him that the time to do it has come. And even if this is symbolic language, I believe that the Son of Man here in Revelation 14 is Yeshua. Now keep your place in Revelation 14 and turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. This phrase, Son of Man, is a title that Yeshua uses of himself frequently in the Gospels. He calls himself the Son of Man 32 times in the book of Matthew. And he's relating to the Son of Man in the prophet Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And that passage says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And they and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So the prophet Daniel says that one like the Son of Man came before the Ancient of Days, which is a name Daniel uses for God the Father, Yahweh. This Son of Man in Daniel's vision is given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that are all everlasting and which shall not pass away or be destroyed. There's only one kingdom like that and it's the kingdom of Yeshua the Messiah. Also, the Bible may call Yeshua the Son of Man in order to emphasize and remind us of his humanity. This son of man in Revelation 14 can't be a, an angel because angels aren't human. They don't descend from men. And as we have seen many, many times, Yeshua of Nazareth is both divine and human. He had the divine nature and spirit and power and authority of Yahweh the God of Israel, wrapped in the flesh of a human body. Now, if you struggle with the deity of Yeshua, we have a list of scriptures that clearly support this. They're back there on the literature rack. Or I can email it to you. But for now, I'll give you just two quick examples. We saw last week that the Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 1 that God created the heaven and the earth but it also says in John chapter 1 verse 3 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6 and Corinthians or Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 that Yeshua created them Yeshua is the creator I'll give you just one other example for now, but please realize there are dozens of these in the Bible. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So if you believe the Bible, Yeshua the man was a human manifestation of God. Doesn't mean there were two gods. I like to think of God as a family with a father and a son that together are one God. Now if you want to see more thorough teaching on this, again, go to my YouTube channel and watch the video called Deity of Yeshua and the Echad or Oneness of Yahweh, or a video called The Transfiguration Part 1 and Yeshua the Lost Lawgiver. Yeshua the Lawgiver. There is simply no doubt of Yeshua's deity if you accept the Bible as God's truth. Let's go on in Revelation chapter 14 now. Verse 16 says, 
And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. That's one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. Here we see Yeshua, who is called the Son of Man 89 times in the Bible, coming on a cloud with a sickle, reaping his harvest. Do you realize what this is? This is the harvest of his people, the believers. This is the rapture and the first resurrection of the dead. In verse 16, Yeshua is harvesting the good crop of his people who are saved, repentant believers. And it's interesting that most of the traditional Christian church misses this clear reference to this event. Most of them are looking for it at the wrong time. It doesn't happen in chapter 4 when John and only John is called up to heaven. And it doesn't happen in chapter 6 when the first horseman rides on a white horse. That rider is not Yeshua but an imposter, the Antichrist himself. The rapture is described in Revelation first in chapter 7 verse 9 as a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds or tribes and people and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. And then again in the retelling of the story here in chapter 14 verse 16 when the Messiah's harvest is reaped from the earth. Now for those of you who have never heard my teaching about the rapture and the first resurrection of the dead, I want to quickly review it with you now to confirm our understanding of this passage in Revelation. And this will, we've talked about this two or three times before since we began the study of Revelation, but this will probably be the last time that we look at it in, in much detail. Some people say there isn't any such thing as a rapture. Well, I believe there is one, and I'll show you why, and I'll share with you from Scripture my understanding about when it takes place. I believe that the rapture is associated with the end times resurrection of the dead, with the gathering of the exiles of Israel and Judah from all over the world, with Yeshua's second coming, and with the restoration of all things. There are many passages of scripture that discuss the resurrection of the dead. It is one of the primary expectations of the end times. The Apostle Paul wrote about this subject to believers at Thessalonica in Macedonia, which we know today as Greece. And before we look at Paul's words, let's talk for just a minute about this word rapture. What is the rapture? is this word in the Bible. Some people like to point out that the word rapture does not appear in our English Bibles. And that's true. But I'll show you how that's irrelevant. Because the concept is there. And it actually is in the Bible in a way. The English word rapture is derived from a Latin word that was used in a 5th century Latin translation of the Bible known as the Vulgate. The Latin word from which we get the English word rapture actually was used in the Vulgate in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. We'll look at that in a moment. But what is the rapture? The rapture refers to the common belief that when Yeshua returns he will snatch away believers who are still alive along with believers who have died catching them all up in the air together where they will be transformed from the mortal state to the immortal state as part of the end times in gathering. And the Bible says that those who are asleep or dead in Messiah, dead in Christ they're resurrected first and then those who are alive when he returns are caught up in the air to join them, all gathered together and transported up into the clouds to meet Messiah in the air. And then, depending on who you talk to, 
Messiah and his people either go back to heaven or to Israel. Some believe that those who are raptured and resurrected go to heaven and remain there forever. Others say they remain in heaven for seven years, including the great tribulation, while God's judgment is poured out on those that remain on the earth, particularly on the Jewish people that didn't believe in Yeshua. And then after the seven years, those who were raptured all return to the earth with Yeshua at his second coming. And, and they fight the battle of Armageddon with him. And then they stay on the earth forever when Messiah's kingdom is established. That version seems to be one of the most popular beliefs. But in my opinion, it's not really the one that lines up best with scripture. Now some believers take what's called the pre-trib position. They believe that the rapture takes place before this final seven-year period. That it takes place at the beginning of that seven-year period. And this is probably the view of the majority at this time. Then there's the mid-trib position, which says that the rapture happens at the halfway point of the seven years. Three and a half years into it. Another popular view is the post-trib position, which says that Yeshua returns at the end of the seven-year period after the Great Tribulation and after God's judgments. And finally, at the bottom, you see the pre-wrath belief that the rapture takes place at or near the end of the Great Tribulation, but before God's wrath is poured out on the wicked. Now, whichever position you take on the timing, it is clear that there is indeed a future rapture. Listen to these words of the Apostle Paul that support it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 15, Paul says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. Dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Notice that it doesn't say that it's before the tribulation. There isn't a verse in the Bible that says that. Notice also this phrase, caught up, in verse 17. If we were reading that Latin translation, the Vulgate, we would see the word rapimur. Rapimur is derived from the root word rapio, which means to carry off someone or something, to snatch away. And the noun form is raptura, which means that catching or that snatching away, that catching up. This Latin word was translated from the Greek word harpazo, which has the same meaning, caught up. So the word rapture is in the Bible if you go back to the Latin. Now, verses 16 and 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4 show that the events described in this passage will happen when Messiah descends from heaven and notice the sequence of these events. When he descends from heaven, the bodies of believers who have already died will rise first. And then the believers who are still alive at the time of his return will be caught up with the resurrected believers who were dead to meet the Messiah together in the air and be with him forever. And it doesn't make any difference whether you believe his return is pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or pre-wrath. Whenever it happens, that's the sequence of events. First, those who are dead in Messiah rise from the graves. The resurrection of the dead happens first. And then those who are alive are caught up in the clouds with them to meet Messiah in the air and be with him always and forever. Now here's a chart showing the pre-wrath rapture position. This is how I believe it'll be. That the rapture takes place at or near the end of the great tribulation, but before God's wrath is poured out on the wicked. 
And here is one reason I believe that. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 4, the Bible says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yeshua and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This is obviously describing people who died during the great tribulation when many will worship the beast and receive the mark of the beast. Those who are beheaded, because they won't worship the beast or his image or take the mark on their foreheads or hands, will come back to life and will live and reign with Messiah. In other words, their bodies will be resurrected and rejoined with their soul and spirit for life in Messiah's kingdom. And John says they will reign with him for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection of the dead in Christ. And it must happen before the rapture of those who are still alive. We know this is the first resurrection because it says so right there in verse 5. The rest of the dead don't live again until after the thousand years are finished. Their resurrection comes later. So the sequence, again, is the great tribulation and then the first resurrection of the dead, followed Im immediately by the rapture of believers who are alive. And then God's wrath is poured out on the wicked. The believers who die in the great tribulation are included in the first resurrection, which Paul says happens before the rapture of those who are still living. This first resurrection and the rapture will happen at or near the end of the great tribulation. And God's people will be spared from his wrath that is then poured out upon the wicked after the great tribulation. And this fits perfectly with Yeshua's words in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21. And it fits with the prophecies of Daniel. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapters 7 through 9, he prophesies about kingdoms of the world that were yet to come at that time. And about end times events. You know, a lot of the Bible is prophecy. And we should be paying attention to it. Look at verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9. He said, And he shall confirm or enforce the covenant with many for one week. It's understood by most people that he's talking about who we think of as the beast or the Antichrist. He shall confirm or enforce the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. So in Daniel 9 27 the prophet says that a covenant will be confirmed for one week which in this context if you read the whole passage it's understood to mean seven years. Many people interpret this as a peace treaty with Israel although it actually doesn't say anything about a peace treaty with Israel. It only says that a covenant is confirmed probably referring to the existing covenant of Torah which would allow the animal sacrifices that God prescribes in the Torah to be reinstated. Now they have to be re reinstated. They have to be resumed because the very same verse says that in the midst or in the middle of that week, they're stopped. And the abomination of desolation takes place. And that's when this peacemaking Antichrist is seen to be the beast who no longer hides his hatred for Yahweh and his people. So after the abomination of desolation, the beast 
will become an especially brutal conqueror during the Great Tribulation. That's why Yeshua warns his people in Matthew 24 that the tribulation follows the abomination of desolation. In Matthew 24, verse 15, he said, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, skip to verse 21, then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. See the sequence? When this happens, it'll be the fulfillment of Daniel 9.27. First, the covenant is confirmed and the sacrifices are resumed. But then three and a half years later, in the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist stops the sacrifices, commits the abomination of desolation, and then the great tribulation begins. This fits perfectly with what Yeshua teaches in Matthew 24. Let's back up just a bit in Matthew 24, and I want to make sure we're all getting this. In Matthew 24, Yeshua is answering his apostles' questions in verse 3. They ask him, uh, Hey boss, what's going to be the sign of your coming in the end of the world or the end of the age? How will we know when this is about to happen, Yeshua? And his answer, which begins in verse 4, includes all the things that will lead up to his return. False messiahs, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, all characterized as beginning, the beginning of sorrows to be followed by persecution, false prophets, deception, and iniquity. In other words, the Great Tribulation. Now, in verse 15, he tells them what will happen right before the Great Tribulation. He says that we will see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. And this is usually understood to mean some kind of desecration in the location of the temple in Jerusalem such as the anti-Messiah declaring himself to be God and demanding worship from everyone in the world and putting an image of himself there. Now Paul tells us more about this abomination of desolation in his letter to the Thessalonians. And he says that the day Yeshua comes to gather us together to himself at the rapture, will not happen before this Antichrist is revealed. And then he tells us what this guy is going to do in the temple. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, Paul says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. He's talking about the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. After that is when things really heat up and get difficult for believers. Again, Yeshua discusses the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, verse 15. And it is right after, right after that, he says six verses later in verse 21, that the great tribulation begins. Then shall be great tribulation. And he clearly means the great tribulation because he says it will be the worst tribulation of all time. Nothing before it or after it is as bad. And then in verses 29 through 30, just a few verses later, he says, It is after the tribulation of those days, when the sun is darkened and the moon shall not give her light, that the Son of Man will be seen coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Over and over and over again, the prophets in the Bible speak of the sun, the moon, and stars being darkened. And it's always associated with a time called the day of the Lord, referring to the time of God's judgment on the wicked, which happens right after the great tribulation. 
And that fits with what Yeshua is saying here in Matthew 24. It's after the great tribulation that we will see him coming. And he's not talking about coming back with his saints to fight the battle of Armageddon at this time. But to gather his people together from all over the world. And he makes that clear. How do I know that? It's in the next verse. He'll send his angels with the sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. When Yeshua sends his angels with the sound, uh, a great sound of a trumpet, it is his elect that are gathered together by the angels, meaning those who are saved. Again, this is the first resurrection of the dead and the rapture which both take place after the Great Tribulation. We find this same sequence of events in the parallel passages in Mark 13 and Luke 21. After the Tribulation, the sun, moon, and stars are darkened, and then Messiah comes to gather his elect. It's very clear that this is the sequence of events. Now, you might say, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say that believers will not be subjected to God's wrath? You're right. It does. That's true. That's in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God has not appointed us to wrath. The problem is that people are confused or misled and they think that the great tribulation is the wrath of God, but they're not the same thing. The great tribulation is when the world, and especially believers, are attacked by Satan and all the forces of darkness that come in Revelation 6 as the seals of the scroll are opened. And this is retold in Revelation 13 as the beast making war with the saints of God. This is not the judgments of God that come later in chapters 8 and 9 with the trumpet judgments and uh, with the vile or bold judgments in chapters 15 and 16 when it's retold. The trumpet judgments and the vile or bold judgments are when the wrath of God is unleashed upon the wicked and faithful, obedient believers will not experience those judgments. Hallelujah. Because we're not appointed to wrath. But we can experience the attacks of Satan during the Great Tribulation. The parallel passage in Mark 13 gives us the same sequence of events beginning with the Great Tribulation, beginning in verse 19. He says, For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And again, we know that he means the Great Tribulation because he says this affliction is the worst of all time, worse than any since the beginning of creation or shall ever be. And then he goes on, beginning in Mark 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the, shun, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fail. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. So we're going to have the worst, of aff worst affliction of all time, the great tribulation. And then the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. And then after that, Yeshua will have his angels gather his people, both the living and the dead, from all over the earth and heaven. The bodies of the dead will be resurrected first, and will rise up out of the graves to be rejoined with their soul and spirit in heaven. And then those who are alive will be caught up in the clouds with them to meet Messiah in the air and be with him forever. And I believe that Yeshua will take them all to heaven for his wedding and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now that's debatable about when that happens. That's where I am at this point in time. It's later that he comes back with his saints 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13 and Jude 14 say that Yeshua will return with his saints. That's when he comes back to defeat and judge his enemies and establish the kingdom for his thousand year millennial reign. Now, 
Let's don't ever let different opinions about whether Yeshua returns before the seven years or before the tribulation or in the middle of it or, the, or at the end of it or whenever interfere with our unity and fellowship with each other and with, with other believers. This is not a salvation issue. It's one of those things that we can agree to disagree on in love and peace. And we can discuss it and share what uh, we believe with others and why. But let's never argue about it. One reason I share this with you is because if the tribulation begins and this pre-trib rapture that most of Christianity is looking for hasn't happened, a lot of people are going to go, what happened? We're not supposed to be here for this. Why? I've, I've, been, I've been mistaught. I've been told the wrong thing. And if I, if I can't believe that, why, I might not be able to believe anything in that book. I mean, there's going to be a lot of confused people who have been taught that they're going to escape the tribulation. And if that doesn't happen, their faith could easily and seriously be shaken. And they could completely fall away and depart from their faith. And in that situation, we would need to be ready to help those people understand that a pre-trib rapture is an interpretation that many people find to be much more difficult to reconcile with the Bible when you take a closer, deeper look. Okay, let's get back to Revelation 14 and finish up. I do want to point out that the Greek word for ripe in verse 15 seems to mean something more like overripe. In other words, it's now, finally, time to reap and there must be no more delay. The exact, precise time for the harvest has come. And the harvest takes place in the very next verse where Yeshua thrusts in his sickle in the earth and the earth is reaped. Now we should learn from this. That the reason God is waiting to send Yeshua for his bride and to begin pouring out his wrath on the wicked is because it's not time yet. This reaping will happen as soon as the harvest of the earth is ripe. And let's also realize that we don't do any of the harvesting today. What we are called to do is to sow the word of God. It is Yeshua who will do the reaping and the harvesting when he comes back. Look at verse 17. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. This is the reaping of the evil or wicked people by angels. It's the harvest of God's enemies that are described as clusters of the vine of the earth, which are going to be cast into the winepress of the wrath of God to be crushed. Evil has its harvest too. The grape harvest is sometimes an idiom for the day of the Lord and, and for the harvest of the wicked that we're going to see in the next two verses. While the wheat harvest is a positive metaphor for the ingathering of God's people, the symbolism of the blood of the grape is always concerned with divine judgment. This reminds me of one of the classic old hymns, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which contains lyrics that speak of this very thing. 
It goes like this. Sing it with me. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vineyard where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Do you understand better what that's talking about now? There are two separate harvests in verses 14 through 19. And they correspond to the harvest of the wheat and the tares in Yeshua's prophetic parable in Matthew 9, uh, 13, where he says they are to grow together until the harvest. And then when the harvest happens, the wheat is put in the barn, but the tares are gathered and bound together and burned. In the same way, the saints of God and the wicked will dwell together on the earth until they are harvested in the last days. Yeshua's followers will be harvested to be with him forever. While the wicked who have rejected him and have rejected Yahweh will be gathered together for punishment and the wrath of God. And this fits with what Yeshua says in John chapter 5 beginning in verse 28. He says, marvel not at this for the hour is coming in, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or condemnation. Okay, let's look at the last two verses quickly and we'll be done. It says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now, unless you're a fan of horse racing, you may not be familiar with the distance of a furlong. Now, the Greek word for furlong here is, uh, for one furlong is stadion, and the plural of that is stadia. One stadium is a little over a tenth of a mile or about 600 feet or 200 yards or 185 meters. It's about the same as two football fields. That's one stadium. We're talking about 1,600 of those here. It's about 184 miles and it happens to be the distance from Megiddo to the area of Petra or Basra. That's interesting. Sounds like a lot of blood, doesn't it? We'll explore this in more detail when we get to chapter 19. But I will share one idea that some commentators suggest is that the blood isn't literally a river that's four or five feet deep up to the height of a horse's bridle, but rather that it splatters up that high. That's possible. Whether this is literal language or figurative language, the vast majority of mankind will literally face the intense wrath of Almighty God. In chapter 15, we will begin to read about the seven last plagues. And in chapter 16, the seven vials or bowls of God's wrath culminating in the battle of Armageddon in chapter 19. Now it seems that verse 20 may be giving us a preview of that battle, of that great day of God Almighty in Revelation 16 verse 14, referring to the defeat of all of Messiah's enemies, the kings of the earth and of the whole world, and of chapter 19 verse 18, referring to the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, horses, and them that sit on them, and of all men, free and slave, small and great. This is how complete the judgment of Yahweh will be. Thank 
God for Yeshua coming in verse 14 to rescue us and take us out of here before this happens. I would not want to be here when God's wrath is poured out. There's going to be a cataclysmic destruction of mankind at the end of this age. So as we end chapter 14, I think the point of this chapter seems to be to encourage and assure Yahweh's people who both keep his commandments and believe in Yeshua, who are living during the great tribulation, to remain faithful to the end because the word of God says that all of their enemies will be judged and punished. And this chapter shows us and reminds us who is going to be triumphant in the end. Yahweh, Father God, and His Son and Messiah, Yeshua, our Savior, and His people. That's you and me if we repent of our disobedience, truly believe in Yeshua, and live according to God's principles and commandments in the Torah.